Well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. And hello to all of you folks online. I don't know if everyone wants to turn around and wave hello to whoever might be out there in the internet. Um, so everyone in here um, knows who I am, but just for those who might be tuning in, um, my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm the Senior Archivist at Witness. And I'm going to be talking to you today about our media archive. So I just want to start by giving a little background about my organization. Um, Witness is an international nonprofit organization that trains and supports activists um, who are using video in their fight for human rights. We were founded 25 years ago this year um, in the wake of the beating of Rodney King, um, an unarmed man by the Los Angeles police. Um, an incident that became uh, known worldwide um, because it was captured on video by a bystander named George Holliday. Out of this, our founder, Peter Gabriel, envisioned a world where all people had this ability to use video to expose hidden abuses. So for the past 25 years, we've provided equipment, training, and support to hundreds of human rights organizations and activists around the world. Um, we've worked with groups to record videos testifying to abuses that have been used to defend human rights in courts and elsewhere. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, when fewer people had access to video technologies to tell their stories, we co-produced dozens of advocacy videos with our partners that were aimed at key decision makers. And today, uh, when more and more people have cameras in their pockets, editing software on their laptops, and social media accounts where they can upload or stream live uh, their own videos. But unfortunately, as we've seen, just having more video and access to video doesn't mean more justice. So video still has to be deployed strategically, and it has to reach the right people. And in this era of alternative facts, um, video needs to be shown to be authentic and truthful. Um, and with metadata that's now embedded in our digital video, it's become more important that activists know how to use video safely and with consideration to the privacy and security of those that they're filming. And because there is now so much video everywhere, we need to know how to best select, manage, and preserve now more than ever. So today, Witness continues to provide training and support so that people can use video safely, effectively, and ethically to protect human rights. We're constantly learning and exploring the evolving human rights video landscape to, uh, to learn and share new approaches to video advocacy. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about how our preservation strategies and workflows have evolved along with this changing landscape, and how, as a very small organization, um, we've worked to maintain our growing collection with very limited resources. So our media archive, which is made up of video um, by our staff and filmed by our partners, um, has grown to include many analog and digital tape, disc, and file-based media um, that are both consumer and prosumer formats, some of which you can see here. So I'm going to start um, just with a brief overview of our tape-based workflow. And I know Erwin will recognize um, Grace Lyle here. She's our, our chief of operations. Who, she's also a professional archivist uh, and found at the archive. Uh, I'm going to talk about our tape-based workflow first, just briefly, since that's where it all started, um, and then walk you through our current digital workflow, which grew out of that. And I'll re be referring to many of the OAIS concepts that we've been reviewing today. And apologies to anybody online, but we've been talking about um, some high-level concepts like ingest and data management today, which I'll be referring to in the presentation. So up until around 2009, our collection was primarily videotape. Um, we have formats including Hi8, Mini DV, Betacam, Digital Betacam, um, and uh, other formats. Uh, 
OK, so the first stage in this tape workflow, um, and we talked about this earlier, this is ingest, but this is sort of in the pre-ingest um, stage is when the film actually gets, the videos actually get created by our partners. So at this stage, the partner is recording the tape and documenting key information like names, locations, and dates. Um, I want to include this step because it's very important, because this kind of information, this metadata, is very difficult to gather later on. So it was really, it's really key that in our training materials, um, we included this documentation process and that we provided templates that were easy for partners to fill out to provide that information for us later on. So then the tapes um, would be physically brought back to witness um, by a staff member or sent by courier, um, along with paper documentation like consent forms, logs, transcripts. Um, generating the AIP, uh, the archival information package, um, or bringing the tapes into the archive um, first involved um, generating identifiers, unique identifiers for the new tapes. I'm pointing this the wrong way. Um, so here's just a, a screenshot from our catalog. It's a little bit uh, blocky. Um, so we generate the identifiers in our cataloging database, which is built in FileMaker. FileMaker is an Apple product um, that is used by a lot of small organizations because it's relatively affordable and easy to use. Um, so in FileMaker, we generate um, two unique identifiers. First is a four-digit, what we call a title ID, which uh, uh, designates the intellectual content. And then a alphanumeric uh, identifier, which starts with a letter and then uh, five digits, which designates the items. So as you can see, this title, My My Soldiers in Military Camp, has three um, copies, um, mini DV cop two mini DV copies and a VHS copy, which each have their own identifiers. Um, uh, yeah, so as you can see on the right, these identifiers get labeled onto the physical items. Um, the alphanumeric prefix on the item ID is assigned based on form factor. So B is for small tapes, D, as you can see there, is for uh, a disc, C is for a VHS. Um, and this is really useful because the item identifiers are also the shelf numbers, so it allows us to maximize um, shelf space by shelving like form factors together. Um, So continuing with generating the archival information package, um, in the earlier days when we got in a tape original, we would create a tape master copy plus an access copy on VHS. And at some point before my time at Witness, this process seems to have stopped. Um, by the time I started at Witness in 2009, um, we were primarily shooting to mini DV at that point. And the ideal Indus workflow involved capturing the tapes to an MOV wrapped, uh, so a QuickTime wrapped DV file. Um, but this, of course, depended on available resources. We've talked earlier about how video is a time-based medium. So if we didn't have the interns um, or staff support to do the capture, many of the tapes would not be captured before being put into storage. So capture often would come later at the point of access as a form of a DIP or a dissemination information package and then be re-ingested as an AIP. So today, of course, um, we're at a time where tape is obsolete um, and there is a pressing need to digitize the content for preservation. So we recognize this and at the same time, I have to work within uh, the resources that we have. So we're lucky to still have amazing interns um, from various moving image archiving and preservation programs and library programs, including several interns we've had from the PNP program here in Amsterdam. Um, usually we'll have, we'll have a semester long internship that will involve um, capturing and ingesting sort of manageably sized mini DV collections, um, uh, viewing it up and researching the content and updating catalog records. Um, we use a software called Live Capture Plus for mini DV capture. Um, this is now considered uh, a legacy software, but it's still available for download. Um, it costs around 60 euros. Um, and you can, of course, 
also capture uh, DV with uh, editing software like uh, Final Cut in Premiere, if you have those. So for all of the other formats, which we can't um, currently support in-house, we've been really lucky to partner with folks to help us with this. Um, the University of Texas Libraries, um, which is our long-term repository for scholarly access, which I will talk about more later, um, has helped us to digitize a large number of our Hi8 tapes. Um, we've also partnered with the New York-based volunteer-run Transfer Collective um, that provides low-cost uh, video transfers for artists, individuals, and small organizations. Okay, so uh, storage. So, and up until recently, we stored our tapes in-house um, in two lockable climate-controlled um, rooms. Uh, our office is based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it's in a nonprofit arts building. So the rooms were built in the interior of our office, so there were no windows, and it had uh, a separate HVAC unit that was separate from our workspace um, HVAC. But it's just a regular office room. It's not like a specialized refrigerator, refrigeration unit or anything like that. Um, we found that over the years, um, maintaining the HVAC was very expensive and very burdensome. Um, the unit would frequently break down or run out of fluid because we were running it at such a low temperature, much lower than a, a regular office. We had a service contract that we paid annually, plus a per hour rate that we would pay for the service people to come in. Um, and if something was actually broken, it might cost thousands of dollars to repair. So, I mean, what, what it was is that we were very, a very small fish in a very large corporate HVAC marketplace. And this business model and service model was not designed for people like us. So in 2005, because of this and other factors, we decided to move the tapes to an off-site commercial storage facility. Um, so while there's certain, certainly trade-offs in terms of access and physical control, um, the annual cost is significantly lower um, and more stable. So that's the tape workflow onto our digital workflows. So as I mentioned, the digital workflow grew out of our tape-based workflow. Um, and rather than building an entirely new um, system to deal with our digital media, we expanded the capability of our existing systems with the help of folks like AV Preserve and Dave Rice, um, who was mentioned earlier. Okay, so starting again with ingest. Um, our first step is to take the video files as they come to us, um, usually on a hard drive or via a file transfer service, um, or as we just discussed, digitized from tape, and arrange them into coherent AIPs, archival information packages, um, based on the provenance on the of the video. So in other words, putting the videos into, uh, that were from a single source or a single event together. So sometimes it, came to, it comes to us very beautifully arranged, and sometimes it takes a lot of work to restore that original order. So here's just a couple of examples of um, SIPs, mission information packages, as they come to us. These are examples of very nicely arranged SIPs. So you see this one on top comes to us. It's just um, still images, so it's not very large files via uh, Google Drive. Um, this one came on a hard drive. It's a bunch of videos of protests um, in Brazil around the World Cup. Um, so what we do is what we ask staff and partners when they're submitting media um, to organize their footage in folders like this um, by date and event um, before submitting to the archive. Um, it's really useful if they put the date and the name of the event in the folder name and include a text file in each folder that gives us more details about the event, um, any credits or restriction information. And that makes it really easy for us to deal with on, on our end. So again, with the digital workflow, we do the same thing with generating identifiers for, um, for the new AAPs. So it's very similar to the tapes. Um, we didn't have to change too much in terms of conceptually. There's a four-digit uh, intellectual content identifier, and then the item identifier for the digital AIP is a six-digit number that starts with the, and, and the letter E.
So then we create a directory in our archival storage, um, which serves as the container for our new AIP. And as you can see, each AIP folder is named with its item identifier, followed by its intellectual content identifier, and then just a short human readable name. Um, we then copy the files from whatever its temporary storage location was into archival storage using uh, rsync, which is a file uh, transfer tool that's commonly used in backup for backup. Um, and then, so then it's in the permanent storage location. Um, and this, and the file path for this is um, both generated within and recorded in our FileMaker database. So um, just one thing to note, because we were talking about policies earlier and to normalize or not normalize, um, we don't uh, re-encode or reformat um, our submitted media in any way. Uh, we retain the file in its original form um, that we receive, although we might transcode for access, like for instance, making ProRes files uh, for production purposes. The only alterations that we will make to a file is um, if is to remove any special characters, so like punctuation marks or like asterisks or dollar signs and that kind of thing. Um, and that, cause, because those will interfere with our backup and with various scripts that run on, on the files. Um, so we just run a very small one line script that changes all the special characters to underscores. Um, and for any raw footage that's coming to us from a camera, this is not usually a problem. Those never contain special characters. So um, in OIS terms, this stage where we're creating the AIP container um, and copying the files to storage would fall under the sort of update. The, it's, it's sort of the interface between the ingest function and, and the storage function. I think it's called update cor uh, coordinate updates. Um, so that's on the storage side. And then on the data management side, that interaction between ingest and data management, um, so in addition to recording the storage location um, and the unique identifier, we also extract the technical metadata out of the files and um, populate the FileMaker database with that data. So that's just some of the technical metadata we get. We don't manually create this, this, um, <coughs> this data. Um, and of course, we just talked about checksums. Um, we generate an MD5 checksum uh, upon ingest, or hopefully s soon after ingest, it gets put into a queue that sometimes breaks. Um, and we also generate an access copy. So up top, you can see uh, this is one of, an example of an access copy. Um, we put in a burned in logo and a burned in time code. Uh, this is a, an H.264, sort of a lower, uh, like a highly compressed H.264 file, um, which we talked about earlier. And then down here is just an example. These are the, the MD5s that are recorded in our FileMaker database. OK, so storage. Um, so we have our primary storage. We also just have like working storage, where it's not uh, archival. It's just so we have workspace in the archive. Um, and we have two offline backups. Um, first backup is to LTO6, and then we also have a, uh, backups to offline three terabyte drives, which just mirror the LTO tapes. Um, and those backups are kept in geographically separated locations. Um, and I think we're going to be talking a bit more about backups and storage tomorrow. So. For uh, writing to the LTOs, we use rsync as well as a collection of tools um, that uh, have been developed by Dave Rice, who's been mentioned a few times today. Um, all of those tools are up on the EMEA Open Source Committee's uh, GitHub page um, under the, the repo called LTOpers. OK, so for data management, um, as I mentioned, our catalog is run on FileMaker server. And as I mentioned before, this is a, a, a tool that's used by a lot of small organizations because it's relatively easy to use. Um, our descriptive and technical metadata um, are, 
technical metadata structure is based on PB Core, and we're able to export PB Core um, records from the database like PB Core XML. Um, however, we also have a lot of cataloging fields that are not uh, PB Core, um, and like, so including like security information or just other <coughs> information for us to manage uh, our, our media internally, and that just doesn't get exported when we export the PB Core. Okay, so access. So we can sort of think of our access sort of as three separate prongs. Um, our archive is mostly accessed by internal users um, for production purposes, um, but we also sometimes license for external use to filmmakers, other organizations, um, uh, and to the media. Um, and then through our agreement with the University of Texas Libraries, which I mentioned earlier, we also provide scholarly access. So internal reuse is very straightforward and actually very low tech. Um, the archivist, who's uh, me, um, receives a query from staff. Uh, I retrieve the material and check the rights, and then I provide a copy either via our network storage or on a hard drive. Um, for external users, uh, we usually re uh, respond to queries um, by sending our licensing rate card. It's just the, the I excerpt from it there, um, followed up by exported catalog records or contact sheets um, to show what we have that we're able to provide access to. Um, and these are just like uh, reports coming out of FileMaker as PDFs. Um, so you probably can guess most users are not really interested in seeing your XMLs. <laughs> they're ha pretty happy with the PDFs. Um, and then I might also provide access copy, those H.264 access copies that I showed you earlier. So that's, that's this stage. After that, if there is content that the external user wants to use, we just drop a license with our um, uh, legal templates that we have in-house, um, receive the payment if that's required, and then we'll deliver the archival master to the user. Scholarly access, we uh, provide um, bags to the University of Texas Library. So our dip, beco our dip becomes their sip. Um, and for the folks at home who are not familiar with Bagit, it's a protocol for packaging digital content for transfer um, developed by the Library of Congress. So um, you folks here all know this, but um, the, a bag is basically a folder structure that, um, at minimum, includes a folder. You have the, your 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 top level folder for your bag. Um, you have a, a folder called data, which includes includes the the thing that you're trying to transfer, whatever it is that you're trying to transfer, your videos or your files, um, and then uh, text files um, that are basically function like packing lists or inventory lists like in a shipping box. Um, so here's just an example of a bag, a witness bag that was sent to the University of Texas um, inside our data folder. You can see this is the video that we're trying to send them. We also include some of our those XMLs that I mentioned. So PB Core XML, um, mods XML, um, and uh, media info um, XML. Excuse me. Um, and so this was negotiated with the University of Texas. So it's part of a policy, our, our sort of submission policy. So, um, so the great thing about this is that because it's standardized, uh, oh, this kind of got messed up. So because it's standardized, UTL is able to validate the bag so that we know and they know that they got what we intended to send. Um, and then they're able to move that to storage. They create their own AIP, and from that, they're able to make derivatives, um, use the metadata XMLs that we sent them to create their own catalog records, and then to provide scholarly access. So here's just an example of one of our videos that they have online. Um, this is their access copy, um, and here's the catalog record that they've created with our metadata.
so basically, that's our digital workflow. Um, and so while we've continued to develop and, and maintain our internal collection, what we've been really focused on in the last few years is looking more outward, um, focused on developing accessible uh, archiving guidance and resources for the partners and activists that we work with. So um, as more people are using their cameras to document human rights, there's emerged this great need um, for basic information. As we talked about earlier, this down to earth kind of information and training on how to manage and save um, media outside of these sort of more institutional methods like we've been talking about. Um, so our work has been to take some of these OAIS concepts and boil them down um, to language that is relevant to somebody, like an individual who's just recording videos on their mobile phone, or a small organization who's collecting video testimonies um, for a court case. So the main website um, where you can find our archiving resources, oh, and this got kind of messed up too, but it's um, archiving.witness.org. That's what it looks like. And on there, you'll find um, our main resource, which is the Activist Guide to Archiving Video. Um, it's available as a website and a downloadable, downloadable PDF in English, Spanish, and Arabic, and later this year in Portuguese. Um, and you'll also find a number of short videos that we've made um, that explain uh, archival concepts and sort of try to make the argument for, for why it's important for activists to think about archiving and preserving their, their media. And maybe if there's time, we can, after the webinar, we can maybe watch one if, there's, if we have some extra time. Um, there's, oh, that title got lost too, but uh, blog.witness.org is another place to check out um, blogs uh, related to archiving human rights video. So, that's actually all f uh, from me, and I'm happy to take any questions online or, or off. Erwin? Yeah, go. Oh. Um, oh, do you need the microphone for the? Um, yeah. Let's, let's, let's use the microphone. Is that yeah? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Um, Thank you, Yvonne. Um, it's a bit of a nitty-picky detail question, yeah. but um, I was really interested in, in the University of Texas uh, partnership that you mm -hmm. have. Um, and when you said that you, you were exporting to PB Corp, but you couldn't include like security information, how does that impact when people access those videos through the University of Texas portal and then aren't aware of certain restrictions that, that may apply? There is some security information, like restriction information that goes into the PB core record, but there is other data that we manage in the catalog, like the, like the person's, like let's say the person's name or something, if we don't want it used in the public record, that's, that just stays in our catalog that doesn't get exported. But the restriction itself does get exported into the PB core record. So, um, you know, the records that we deliver to, to UT that can't be put online, that's indicated in the XML. Any questions? Thanks. Um, thank you. I think that was a fantastic example of, of translating the OAS model, which is a very abstract thing, to something very practical. So I think it's it's really eye-opening to see, you know, even like at a very small organization, how you implement that. Um, but I'm also interested in the University of Texas yeah. uh, relationship that mm -hmm. you have. Um, the negotiation of the SIP requirements yeah. that you have with them, what was that process like? How did you work through that with them? How long did it take? And what were sort of the, some of the negotiating points on each side? Like what were their requirements versus what were yours? Um, I'm going to have to think back to that because it was back in 2010. Uh, the process did take 
I would say at least a couple of months, if not more. And it wasn't just negotiating the SIP, it was ne negotiation, ne ne negotiating the whole like deposit um, arrangement. So there is like a you know contract that both of like lawyers on both sides um, analyze. Like one one of the points I remember that got discussed was because UT is a public institution, if they were ever to be subpoenaed for content in their repository, they are sort of obliged to hand that over. And because we have stuff in our collection that has security restrictions, um, the way we resolved that in the end was that we would be informed if you know, a subpoena ever came through, and then we would have the opportunity to try to take um, any action. So that was just one example of, of some, some things that got negotiated. Um, out of, so out of the sort of our, our talk back and forth about this, the SIP um, and the metadata requirements, um, UT actually generated a whole metadata uh, sort of handbook that they've used with other partners um, in terms of like mapping and that kind of thing. So. Um, I think you know just that negotiation like had a sort of a, a broader um, impact and, and benefit. So I thought that was really great. Um, but I think the, the, the negotiation was you know there's like what we could provide, what we were able to provide. So up until that point, we had not built the ability to export the PB Core XML. It was because of this partnership that we had this a reason to do that. Uh, I mean, it was a good thing that up to that point, we had built the database to be able to export that XML in for that future date that we would be able to actually implement that as a, as a you know, as a feature of, of the catalog. So, um, so it was a balance between like what we were able to do with what we had and what they could accept um, and work with. Um, and I think in terms of some of the partners that were that have worked with them on this human rights documentation initiative, you know, I think maybe we were a little, like a little bit further along in terms of the metadata on our side and having sort of that structure. Um, I think, a, you know, that's sort of with smaller organizations, it's quite rare. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Just a very uh, short practical question. Um, you're using R-Sync yeah. to sync files within the organization. Not to sync files. Or to transfer files within the or organization. Yeah. And then you're using Bagit externally. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And so why wouldn't you use, use Bagit internally? Um, so for R-Sync, we just used to literally like as an alternative to just copy or drag. So we're just using it to move the files from one place to another, not to do the checksumming, not to package into AIPs or anything. So I guess we don't need the functionality of uh, Bagit to just to move the files. Um, I mean, maybe if we were sort of reconceiving our AIPs at this point, maybe it would be a good idea to use a bag as an AIP. It certainly has like a lot of you know additional information, but that's not. Um, I, I don't think bag it exists. Exists. I mean, rsync is very reliable for just transferring files. Um, and the great thing with rsync is that if you're transferring like a large batch of files, and video files tend to be very large, if your transfer gets interrupted, you can start it again. Um, and also it creates a log, or you can have it create a log, so you can just ensure, you know, when you're using like drag and drop, like you don't know if something finished copying, if you're copying hundreds of files, you might have not copied something, you delete the temporary, the, the temporary storage and you don't have your, your files, so. Do we have questions from people online? Yeah. Oh, we do. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, just quickly, two questions I saw, oh, there are even more now. Um, there's one question from Lynn, um, it's about Witness. Um, does Witness record and archive their own footage on human rights events or marches? Take, for example, the Women's March last yes. week. Yes, so yeah, a, a large proportion of our collection is um, video, videos that were shot by our staff, um, and a number of our staff attended the Women's March. So I have not seen that media yet. And also just with, um, 
you know, ch changes, uh, you know, s staffing wise, um, I'm uh, work working at a bit of a distance from our, 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 our New York office. So, um, yeah, so I haven't seen that footage yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, we've been working um, to develop some, you know, just like looking, exploring the new ways that video is being used um, and how uh, we were doing live streams from the march, as I understand. Um, so I'm really, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that went. Thank you so much. There's another one from Ritha. She asks, how do you go about making activists aware of the training uh, resources you have available online? I mean, that is a huge thing. That's like a big part of what I do. And um, my colleagues at Witness is the outreach part. Um, you know, for instance, when we developed the Activist Guide to Archiving video, you know, we spent like a year creating the resource and then like a year doing active outreach on it. Um, so like creating the thing is not really enough. Like you really have to spend just as much time like telling people that it exists and then making it accessible in languages that they can read, um, creating content in multiple forms. So, you know, we have this guide, which is like 100 pages long, um, but we decided to make these four minute videos as well um, because not everybody wants to read a 100 page guide. So, um, so yeah, outreach is a huge thing and it's, it's really important and a lot of people spend a lot of time doing it at Witness. So. Great, thank you. There's one final question I have from the online audience. It's from uh, Gualbordo. Uh, what kind of codec are you using for archiving? Um, so as I mentioned, we don't re-encode the media that we receive in any way. So we're storing whatever the original format that comes to us is. Part of it is that we, we do need to keep the original, you know, to, as I mentioned, showing authenticity is very important these days. So keeping the original authentic file is really important. Um, those files also contain embedded metadata that if you transcode it um, or normalize the file, that metadata can be lost or just altered to reflect the new file that it is. Um, so we really want to maintain the original. Um, and at some point, probably, you know, as formats become obsolete, we're going to have to think about our strategy for migration or emulation. But um, and maybe it's not a great thing that we don't have that strategy already in place. But honestly, we're a very small organization, and we have like more pressing priorities and needs that are not that we haven't we don't have the solution for, like our digitizing our tapes. That. The, the deadline for those things are coming sooner. So that's where we need to focus our energy. Thank you, Yvonne. That's it from the online audience. Is there anyone? Yeah, Peter. Couldn't resist on the codec thing. Um, <laughs> one thing you might want to do, just to increase your chances, is if you have files that play right now yeah. using like FFmpeg, for example, as I mentioned before, when you have an open source implementation that can decode the file, mm -hmm. you increase your chances. So if you, if you look, like, kind of test the files that you have with an open source implementation that can decode it, right. and then you archive that implementation and the source, as I said before. Archive the actually, FFmpeg. Yes, because um, then, as I said before, mm. then you have an option in the future. To if like it. the license, the patent situation for a certain codex or mm. containers changed, happened in the past, mm. or it goes out of, like, uh, it becomes obsolete. Just means like there's not enough users interested in doing mm. it anymore. I thought on your screens that you had like 3GP, which is like a mobile phone right. format. It was popular at some time but yeah. long story short like you could increase your chances we can hmm. chat about this afterwards if you want hmm. to interesting well yeah That's thanks anyone else all right then we're wrapping up i guess thank you all for your attention thank you thank you